abundantly clear is there are many partners and businesses that care about this very issue and with focused attention and on the ground implementation, these impaired streams can be brought back to health in our lifetimes. We truly value our partnership with Stroud Water Research and it is my pleasure to welcome Jessica Provinsky to say a few words. Hi everyone. Thanks so much for joining us virtually. Uh, my name is Jessica Provinsky and I work for Stroud Water Research Center. For those of you who aren't familiar with us, the Stroud Center was founded 53 years ago with a laser focus on freshwater systems through global research, environmental education, and watershed restoration. We are fortunate to be able to engage with so many great partners throughout Lancaster County from the farmers that our restoration team works with to help implement best management practices, our restoration team who's working with farmers and other landowners to monitor streams throughout Lancaster County, our education team leading programs for students, professionals, and educators. And then of course, there's our wonderful relationship with the Lancaster Conservancy. And we're so thrilled to be involved with Lancaster Water Week for the third year. Um, while we can't all be together, I think you're really going to enjoy the underwater journey, journey that Dave is about to take us on. Um, feel free to visit our website to learn more about our specific research, restoration, and education projects, or see what upcoming virtual, for now, events we have planned. Um, a special thank you to Mid-Atlantic Farm Credit for their sponsorship of this webinar. Um, I hope you guys all enjoy it. And for now, I'm going to turn you back over to Fritz, who's going to introduce Dave. Thank you so much, Jessica. Today's presentation is being recorded and will be shared with everyone who is pre-registered. This lecture, along with all our virtual lectures and vast catalog of short documentaries, will be posted at the Lancaster Conservancy YouTube channel in the coming week. Just log on to YouTube and search Lancaster Conservancy. You still have time to take the Lancaster Water Week pledge to take action to clean up our local streams. Our number one action step is create habitat. With your pledge, you're able to sign up for a free pledge kit and a native tree and pollinator flower while supplies last. To take the pledge, visit LancasterWaterWeek.org. Finally, Water Week is only possible because of the very generous support of our sponsors. These are local organizations and businesses like Stroud Water Research that are passionate about clean water. Through their generous support, we are able to host these events and they've helped us contribute over $120,000 in grants to clean water implementation here in Lancaster County. Turkey Hill Dairy has been our presenting sponsor since the founding of Water Week in 2020 and 2017. Today, I also wanna recognize the Campbell Foundation, Chesapeake Bay Foundation, and their Keystone 10 Million Tree Partnership, the Lancaster County Community Foundation, Nimblest, Laxwama, High Foundation, the City of Lancaster, Brookfield Renewable, and the Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay. We also wanna thank Lancaster Clean Water Consortium, Eurofin, Stroud Water Research, Flyway Excavating, St. Boniface, Atlee Hall, Fulton Bank, Exelon Energy, Land Studies, Landis Homes, Hershey, Natural Light Films, Octoroa Native Plant Nursery, Inframark, Lancaster County Conservation District, Lancaster General Health, and Donegal Trout Unlimited. That is a significant list of incredible organizations. Each of them have invested in Water Week and each has had a hand in creating or preserving critical habitat to help Lancaster move toward a more balanced and healthy ecosystem. And now I want to I would want, now I want to introduce Dave Funk, the main reason we're here. For the past 35 years, Stroud Center's entomologist Dave Funk has collected and sampled macroinvertebrates in streams around the world. In the process, he has taken stunning photography of these insects and developed special equipment to further hone his craft. Funk's photographs have appeared in numerous books and magazines, including Natural History, Scientific American, Ranger Rick, National Wildlife, Wings, BBC Wildlife, and Nature Australia. What an impressive list. Welcome, Dave. Pleased to be here. <laughs> so uh, I, th I assume you can see my screen. We good? Yes, we can. All okay. good. All right. So um, I've worked at Stroud Water Research Center for 
40 some years now, pretty, pretty amazing to think about. And uh, Stroud Center is dedicated to the study of fresh waters and a large part of what we do here has to do with aquatic insects because, I'll, and I'll tell you why in a moment, but um, this is the front view of the laboratory part. We have a big greenhouse in the rear, we built in 1999 that has fresh stream water running through it um, where we can run experiments. And uh, then we, uh, in, in 2012, we completed this new Moorhead environmental complex, which houses our uh, education and watershed restoration groups, as well as our outreach and administration. Um, we're situated right along the East Fork of the East Branch of the White Clay Creek, which in the year 2000 was designated as part of the National Wild and Scenic River Program. And we're really fortunate to have this stream right outside our lab. In fact, we have it inside too. That's one of the unique things about our lab. Since it was built in 1967, a portion of that creek's been diverted into our building and runs right through these PVC channels before returning to the creek outside. Um, life in our indoor stream in many ways mirrors that in the outdoor stream. All the flora and fauna come in with the water. And this includes most of the 250 or so aquatic insect species that populate White Clay Creek outside our lab. A large portion of our research centers around these insects, not just because as a group they constitute the bulk of the animal consumers in the stream, but because their presence or absence can tell us a lot about water quality. And I'll get back to that later. So this is sort of an introduction I'm gonna do into aquatic entomology. Um, which I love and I think other people like it when they see the pictures. So streams like this one you're looking at uh, are teeming with insect life, but it's really difficult to see them right where they live. Now one way to look at them is to put a net in the stream and kick around above it to dislodge and capture them and dump them into a pan. Uh, however, you can't really see what they're doing on the stream bottom in this way. Now, I've been a photographer for many years and I always thought it'd be really nice to observe the insects right where they live. So some years ago, I came up with a way of doing that to photograph insects right on the stream bottom. And I modified an SLR camera with a waterproof snoot and a submersible flash to light the subjects. With this rig, uh, I and hopefully the camera stay dry while the lens peers down through the effective, through a, effectively a glass bottom bucket. With this arrangement, I can see and photograph insects on the rocks right where they, where they live. Here's a herd of small mayflies. Uh, the one in the pale one in, this, in the upper right, in the upper middle there is one that's just molted. There can be quite a crowd uh, on the stream bottom in some of the favorite spots like this rock right in the fast current. You can see mayflies here and, and uh, black fly larvae and they're all jostling around to find the best place for their perch. So what I'm gonna do is, um, this, is, this presentation is intended to be an introduction to the major groups of aquatic insects and what they do. And I'm gonna start with the mayflies, um, which are unique among insects in a number of ways. But mayflies uh, constitute the order of Femeroptera and there's about, there's over 3000 species worldwide. They're a really ancient group, date from the Carboniferous over 300 million years ago. All mayfly nymphs, the, the immature stages are aquatic. Um, the adults are terrestrial. They come out of the water to mate and, and disperse and lay eggs. Most uh, mayflies, as in the larval form, are herbivores or detritivores. And this group is particularly pollution sensitive. So they're often considered kind of the canary in a coal mine. When mayflies disappear from a stream, it's got problems. So mayflies generally spend 99 plus percent of their life as aquatic nymphs which may be up to several years in some species, and emerge as a terrestrial adult for only a very brief period, anywhere from about 20 minutes to several days. This is an adult mayfly, a very small species, about a centimeter long. Mayfly nymphs are abundant in all types of freshwater habitats, ranging from torrents like this uh, river in northern Quebec to backwaters, ponds, and lakes. A typical healthy stream, such as this one here is Rio Tempesquito at our laboratory in Costa Rica, uh, support many species of mayflies. This one has 44 species. White Clay Creek behind our lab has 55 species. They're most diverse in habitats like this riffle, um, dominated by cobbles perched on gravel with, and sand with lots of interstitial spaces. These rocks may look rather barren, but they're covered with a thin biofilm 
dominated by single-celled algae called diatoms, which are the predominant food source for most mayflies. Um, if you scrape the film off one of those rocks and look at it under a microscope, it'll look somewhat like this, magnified about 400 times. You can see the individual diatoms here, and the, they come in quite a variety and shapes and sizes. And the chlorophyll in diatoms is, has this slightly brown coloration, which gives it that distinctive brown bottom on the stream. Uh, in fact, at Stroud, in our greenhouse I showed you, we actually farm diatoms by streaming creek water from White Clay Creek over acrylic plates. Uh, that then can be removed and used to feed all the bugs we do in our experiments in the laboratory. Another important food source for mayflies and other aquatic insects, especially in small streams, is leaves that fall into the stream in the fall. And these streams will get skeletonized by the feeding of various aquatic insect species and end up looking like this. So mayfly nymphs come in quite a variety of forms that often reflect the particular type of habitat and behavior that they, that characterize that species. So forms like this one here, perch on the stream bottom, but can swim really fast in short bursts with up and down undulations. And these tails in the back are like the, 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 the tail of a, of a, a whale or a, a dolphin. Now you might think the bright color pattern like this would make them conspicuous to predators, but this same species here seen on a more typical substrate actually blends in quite well with this disruptive kind of color pattern. It's actually hard to see the legs there. Many species of mayflies have extremely flattened bodies like this guy. These guys are very poor swimmers, but their flattened form allows them to cling to the rock surfaces in very fast currents and they can sprawl around very quickly on the rock surface to avoid predators. This distinctively patterned species is actually an endemic to the Susquehanna River. That's the only place it's found. Um, and it's another one of these flattened ones that sprawls around rocks. Some of these flattened guys actually use their gill plates. These are the gills along the side of the abdomen here, these big plates. And together, these, these plates form sort of a suction cup, which makes it very difficult for predators to pry them for the, from the water surface, I mean, from the rock surface. And these guys live in really, really fast water, right? Often at the top of waterfalls. So here we see a flattened sprawler next to one of the swimming forms. Both these guys live in really fast current. The swimmer guy can take very quick bursts of swimming even upstream in the fast water just for a few centimeters just to avoid predators that are crawling around out there, which there are many of. The sprawler guys uh, can't swim. They stay close to the rock and try to remove, avoid being removed. Here's another swimming form. So there's a lot of, of, of species that have this very streamlined body form that, that allows them to swim, but they can still hang on in fast currents. These, another form of uh, mayflies are what they call the spiny crawlers. And this is a big group. Um, these guys are poor swimmers and they're slow crawlers, but they're really good at hanging on. And they use their tails to uh, up, up turn tails like this one here to uh, discourage predators from eating them. Some of these spiny crawlers are really flat too. This is a flattened version. This, uh, this one's actually a predator. It's an ambush predator and it's a flattened crawler that ambushes other little mayflies like, those, like the swimming forms I showed you. Some of these guys are so flat and cryptically colored that you can hardly make them out against the rock. This guy here. Now you go into the, the whoops, slower water habitats. Um, the, the type of mayflies that live in slower currents have very different body form. Um, this is one that's called, one of the group called the prong-gilled mayflies. And they can crawl quickly and they're pretty good swimmers too. And they have large gills on the abdomen uh, that allow them to extract oxygen even when it's scarce, which it can be sometimes in these slower flow areas. Here's another image of that. You can see how they get the name prong-gilled mayflies. Now there's whole groups of mayflies that are specialized in burrowing in soft sediments. Um, and these guys are uh, diggers and they have enlarged mandibles in the front here that they use to dig and, and they have digging like uh, almost mole-like forelegs. And they construct tubes that they live in in soft sediments. Here's another one like that. You can see these big tusks in the front they uses to dig. And they use these long filamentous uh, uh, gills to create a current in the, in the tube to keep the water flowing through and get enough oxygen because oxygen can get low, uh, can get scarce down in those soft sediments. 
Here's another burrowing form that has really long tusk-like mandibles that it uses to pry its way down underneath rocks that are embedded in sand. And there's a number of mayflies that actually filter stream water. So these guys live in fast current and the forelegs up here have these long hairs that they use, they put in the current and they filter out food particles from the fast currents. So mayflies, as I said, live most of their life in the water. But when the nymph stages grow up big enough to become mature and merge into an adult, um, they crawl, many of them crawl to the edge of the stream like this individual. And you can tell ones that are about to merge because the, these wing pads, these developing wing pads here turn very dark and you can actually see crumpled up uh, adult wings underneath the skin there. So this one's still in the water, but he crawls over and to the water's edge and emerges the subimago. The first adult wing stage merges right out of the skin at the edge of the water here. And it's a very quick movement and it crawls right out and Mayflies are unique among the winged insects in that they have two wing stages. So the first one, we, the entomologists called a subimago or subadult seen here. Uh, fishermen call these duns. Um, they're also unusual in that they can fly immediately. So these, there's no need for hardening of the wings first like many other insects have to do. And subimagos have microscopic hairs all over the body and wings which are not easily wetted. And this gives them a soft translucent appearance like this and helps them avoid being impaled on the water surface. Um, and I think that's why fly fishermen refer to them as a dun. So the dun stage lasts in most mayflies a day, and then the very next day they molt again into what we call the imago, the final stage. Fishermen call these spinners. You can usually tell an imago because they have clear wings. They've lost that hydrofuge uh, surface uh, of, of the, that the uh, subimago has. And mayflies are the only insects that can molt again with functional wings. Um, now, some of them have to crawl over to the water surface to do that, but others can do it right out in the middle of the stream. So this is an individual of that, of that sprawling type I was showing you that was right on a big flat rock at the top of a waterfall. And I took this photo. You can see its black wing pads here was about to ready to emerge. And a moment later, I saw, I turned around and, and all was left was the skin there. And these guys actually, create an air bubble, they pop out of their skin, float to the water surface, and take flight all in one motion. So all that was left on the rock was this nymph skin here. Now, mayflies, uh, are, as I said, are the only ones that can, can uh, molt uh, in the wing stage. And this is a little video I took showing that process in, a, in, in, a, in one species. So, and, and keep in mind, mayflies are the only ones that can molt their wings, and it's kind of fun to watch how they get out of that. This is um, speeded up slightly. This one, this is about 50% speeded up, so that it doesn't last too long on the video here. But you can see it pulls right out, and those nice soft-looking wings now are clear and transparent. And she's ready to go. So, the two stages of the adults of mayflies often look really different. This is the subimago of, of a species like that one I just showed you. And the same individual the next day molted with these, these clear wings, looks totally different. Here's a female, that same one, uh, similar looking as a subimago. And when she molts through, she's got these dark patterns and the clear part on the back wing. Now there's other differences between those two stages of mayflies. And most notably in the males, the males get really long forelegs, and these are used because mayflies all mate in swarms, big swarms uh, often over the water, and they mate in flight. And males have these long legs that they use to grab the females from below and clasp them and mate with them. So um, compare that with a female. This is a female of the same species. See the short wings. But another uh, conspicuous difference between male and female mayflies generally is that males have really large eyes, the compound eyes in the front here. Um, here you can, uh, with the inset here, you can see the female that, for comparison, quite a bit smaller eyes. And if you look from the top, from the dorsal, you see these huge eyes here, which actually meet in the middle. And these eyes are because male mayflies find their mates visually. And the, so big eyes, the better to see you with. Um, the male's uh, eyes, because they approach from below, they're big on the top and, and they look just like the females below. So a typical mayfly life history 
uh, is this can be, uh, is, is like this species, which we find in White Clay Creek and abundant in a lot of streams around our area. Um, this is one that the fishermen call the pale evening dun. So th the nymphs spend the better part of a year crawling around on the stream bottom, grazing algae. And when they reach maturity, um, for many species, that's in the spring and May for this species, they emerge as a subimago. So this is a freshly emerged male uh, of the pale evening dun. The next day it molts again into this, the clear winged imago form. You notice the big eyes in this guy. Here's a female for comparison. So that evening of their second adult life, day of their adult life, they take wing and they form these swarms right around dusk over the stream, high up over the stream. And these are mating swarms or courtship swarms. Males scramble to be the first one to find any female that comes into the swarm and mate. A female coming in mates once and then immediately drops out of the swarm and hovers a foot or so above the stream and extrudes this ball of eggs. This is a female, this is a picture taken in flight and she's extruded this big ball of eggs. That's her entire uh, contribution to the next generation. Once they're fully extruded, the female drops to the water surface and releases that ball and then that's it. She's spent, life is complete. Males, meanwhile, return to the swarm to attempt additional matings. But the adult of mayfly is very short, generally a couple of days, some species even shorter. And this is one of the ones that's really short. Um, this is an emergence of a species called the white fly. This is along the upper Susquehanna, taken right at about this time of year. The real common occurrence this time of year. Uh, male subimagos emerge from the water surface at dusk and they fly to shore and immediately molt to the imago and then go out over the water to catch emerging females. This is out over the water surface. Females of this species don't even make the final molt, they, but rather mate immediately once they come out of the water and start extruding eggs. And this whole process takes less than an hour. So we, in this case, we park the car along the stream bank uh, and, and you can see that showing the headlights out over the river so you can see these guys because it's dark by this time, completely dark. And of course, mayflies tend to come to light. So a lot of them ended up coming right up to the car headlights. And at the end of it, you can see the carnage. Uh, at the end of the evening, the ground beneath the headlights is piled high with bodies. So this is, this is uh, th these are particularly short-lived mayflies, but all mayflies have very short-lived adults relative to the rest of the, of the life. So another group of common in, st in streams is the stonefly. So this is another order of insects, the or order known as Plecoptera. And there's about 3,500 species of these worldwide. Nymphs are all aquatic. Adults terrestrial, sort of like the mayflies. Most stoneflies are predators uh, or detritivores. One of the first groups of, of insects to disappear when water quality degrades, especially when, when low oxygen uh, happens, are the stoneflies. And this is partly because um, they're, they're, they, they're very susceptible to, to oxygen de de uh, deprivation because many of them don't have any gills. So this is a typical non-gilled mayfly nymph living in the stream bottom. And these guys tend to live in small streams that are fairly turbulent and, and, and have lots of oxygen in them. Some species of uh, stoneflies do have gills, like this group here, these pearled stoneflies have little filamentous gills on the side, but unlike some of the mayflies that can flap their gills, these guys cannot do that. And so they still are fairly sensitive to low oxygen. So here's a common gilled uh, predatory stonefly around our area called Echoptera. And these guys are, are fierce predators. They crawl around trying to catch those mayflies I showed you earlier. Now the adult of the uh, stonefly um, looks quite different from mayflies. They typically have four large wings that are about the same shape and they, and they pile them on the top of the, stack them on the back of the abdomen like this. So, it, so they're all superimposed. They remind you a little of a, a winged termite. Now, so here's a nymph of a non-gilled predatory species that likes small, well oxygenated streams. And here's the adult of that guy. The nymphs of this species uh, are often called roach-like um, stoneflies. They live in really tiny streams and they feed on the leaves that drop in the stream in the fall. And again, the adult. The adults of uh, stoneflies most, mostly look pretty similar, uh, especially to humans. 
There's not a lot of variety in the adult forms. There's more variety than nymphs, but still not the kind of variety you see in mayflies. And stoneflies, when they emerge, they all have to come out of the water. They crawl out. So here's a, may, a stonefly nymph that's crawled out onto a rock. And here's a quick sequence. Its skin splits on the top. The adult pops out. The wings uncrumple. They pump the wings up. Then they pop. Then they put the wings down. And then it takes about uh, probably an hour or so for those wings to harden up so that they're ready for flight. Now another group uh, that's that's really together with the mayflies and the stoneflies, the caddisflies make up what biologists refer to as the EPT, and this is really important water quality studies. The E, P, and T stand for the uh, Latin names of their orders, ephemeroptera, plecoptera, tricoptera. And these are generally the dominant groups of insects in healthy streams. So caddisflies um, is, is an entire order. They're all aquatic. There's over 14,000 species worldwide. And it includes very, ones that do various things, grazing algae, eating to try, uh, dead, dead leaf material, some are predators. And the larvae and pupae, the, uh, caddisflies have complete metamorphosis like their sister group, the Lepidoptera. And so the larvae and pupal stages are aquatic and the adults are terrestrial. So caddisflies are known for the use of silk to build cases or retreats, but some larvae are free living like this guy, which is a predator, free living predator called Rycophila and they crawl around and eat other insects on the bottom. But the majority of species build cases out of various materials uh, which they live in and drag around with them as they move. And some like this remind you of kind of, of a bagworm. And they use various materials. The materials tend to be very specific to that species. In fact, um, entomologists that work on caddisflies can usually tell the species just by the case. They don't need the animal. Some use pieces of uh, wood and sticks like this. And these guys generally live among the leaves that settle out on the stream bottom, and that's what they eat. Others cut plant material into thin pieces like this and construct a square cross-section thing we call a chimney case. This particular guy uh, does that and then fastens the case down to the, fr to the front of the case down to the rock, to a rock in very fast water, and, and then raises its legs and filters, catches particles of food out of the water as the current goes by. Lots of uh, caddisflies use uh, mineral material for their cases, especially ones that live out on rocks in the faster water, and this probably gives them some ballast in the current. So this guy grazes diatoms off the rock surface and makes this little sand and rock cased case. This is a related type that uses big stones on the side of the case, probably to give it better balance, because this guy's always out in the fastest waters. Uh, different Caddisflies use very specific types of, of mineral material. Um, the size and type of mineral is highly specific. Um, and this is one that uses fine sand and lives in the slower currents. This guy actually makes a, a case that looks like a snail shell. It's shaped exactly like a snail shell. In fact, uh, someone first found these cases many years ago and thought it was a type of snail. But as you can see, it's made out of sand that's cemented together with silk. Some use make silken purse shaped cases like this. This particular guy from, coast, from uh, Peru uh, makes a long stalk that suspends it out from a rock on, on the bottom of the stream. We don't really know why they do that. And then a lot of species of caddisflies use silk to, to create um, filtration nets on the stream bottom. And if you look on the bottom streams, you can awfully, often see these out in the fast uh, tops of rocks and fast waters. And so the caddisfly larva is down in, the, in a little retreat down here, and this net he spun is almost like a spider web up here, but this section here is what he uses to filter particle, uh, fil food particles from the flowing waters. And these nets are very distinctive looking, and they have distinctive mesh sizes here. So here's looking down the barrel of one uh, that's been constructed there, and this is where the catchment area for the food particles. Um, and you often see them like this sticking up on the rocks, Sometimes you see two or three of them together. They're competing for the best little spot for the best current. Some uh, in slower water, some species of caddisflies make these big cornucopia shaped nets like this that filter water. This one's about three or four inches long and the water comes in this end and filters back and the larva lives. This is a, what the larva looks like back in the little retreat in the back here. Some make little purse case 
uh, things that are fixed to the rock. And the, and the larva lives inside this thing. And you can see him sticking out here, out to one of the holes at either end. And he grazes all the diatoms off his little plot there. Some make sand cases against the rock to do similar kind of things. And caddisflies are often gregarious, especially to the end of their life. So they, as I said, the larva's aquatic and so is the pupil stage. The pupil's, you know, analogous to the chrysalid in a butterfly or the cocoon in a, in a moth. And all caddisflies, even the ones that don't make cases, that, uh, as a larva, they make a case to pupate in, or they reuse the one that the larva had and seal it off. So, but when, the, when it's time to emerge, uh, caddisfly pupae, unlike the pupae of moths and butterflies, are quite mobile. They can crawl around. So this is a pupa, and they can also swim. They have, often have swimming hairs here. So they, they have special mandibles that they cut their way out of that case, and they swim or crawl to shore up on a rock, and then they emerge out. Here's one emerging. It only takes a minute or two. And then here's the adult with the wings out. And uh, caddisflies are kind of like mayflies, isn't that they can fly pretty much right away. They don't need to wait for their wings to harden. You can see the pupil skins right behind them here. So caddis uh, flies look a little like some moths, but they don't have scales on their wings like the lepidopter do. They're actually hairy winged. That's the name trichoptera means hairy winged. Uh, they come in a variety of, of subtle looking patterns. Entomologists can recognize some of this, but most people don't really notice them unless they come to their light at night and they look like a little brown moth. Some of them hang out on rocks near the water where they emerge from and don't move around much. Here's one where the female doesn't even have wings and she never leaves the water's edge. Most of them, as I said, are kind of dull looking, but there's a few really pretty ones. Here's one that we reared from Costa Rica that has quite striking colors. Some of them are conspicuous. Some caddisflies swarm as adults like, like mayflies do, uh, but others leave a real secretive life and the only way you're likely to see them is if they come to light. I'm gonna talk about one last group here because I don't wanna go over my time, but so the EPTs, the first three orders I showed you are the ones that are generally characterize uh, healthy streams. And when those disappear, you've got some real problems. Uh, the true flies though, are the dip, the order Diptera. Uh, some ha has some aquatic families. Most of them are terrestrial, but um, there's a few families that, that are hugely abundant in streams and they do various types of feeding. The larvae are aquatic of these, the pupae are usually aquatic too, but the adults are terrestrial like the other ones we talked about. Now, one family in particular of the, of the true flies, the coronamid midges are extremely diverse and often really abundant in the streams. And some of them are quite tolerant of pollution or low oxygen levels. These guys with the red body color here, these larvae, they have hemoglobin, which helps them in these low oxygen situations that are often associated with organic pollution. Adult midges are small, uh, generally quite small, and often referred to as gnats. And uh, they look a little bit like a mosquito. And like mosquitoes, the males have these plumose antennae that they use in swarms. These are actually sound detecting uh, devices that actually detect the hum of the female's wing beats. Uh, and the adults often look like a little like a mosquito, but they don't bite. The larvae are worm-like and they live on the either free living like this on a rock or make these little silken retreats all over rocks and do various things like that. I think in the, in the name of time right now, I'm gonna skip ahead and tell you a little bit about why we're gonna, why we look at these things. Um, I'm gonna skip ahead here. Um, so, you know, I hope I haven't overwhelmed you with just that, that those aquatic insects, but the message you should take away is that healthy streams and rivers contain an abundant and diverse insect fauna. In fact, we can actually measure the health of a stream by assessing the numbers and types of insects that live there. And we do this with a device like the, this one here, which, which essentially delineates a known area of stream bottom and we remove all the rocks and brush off and, and remove all the bugs from that stream and collect them in a, in a net, all the, all the ones from that little area of the stream. And at this spot here on the upper Susquehanna where we're doing this, there can be up to 25,000 individuals per square meter of stream bottom there. So we take the data 
of this, all the numbers of spe the, the species and the numbers of individuals, and we can plug this into a program that essentially gives us a numerical rating of water quality. Uh, this one we call the MOS score here, and it's an, it, this is the, the rating uh, in terms of water quality. And we kind of arbitrarily uh, break it into good, fair, and poor here. But for example, this is 19 streams here, uh, 19 major tributaries of the Schuylkill River Basin of about 10 years of data that we've rated uh, based on 10 years of sampling here as good, fair, or poor. So it's some, in some ways it's ironic that I became an aquatic entomologist because I grew up along a beautiful stretch of Red Clay Creek in Northern Delaware, just across the border here from where, from where I'm talking to you now. And I was totally unaware of aquatic insects at the time, even though I was a bug collector. In fact, I'd been an avid bug collector since about the third grade. And every night uh, when I lived along that creek, um, I'd put a light out like this and collect. I was especially interested in moths then, which come to, to black light and it really draws them in. Well, if you put a, a sheet up like that next to the Susquehanna, like where the picture I showed you a, a minute or so ago, uh, on a typical evening right around this time of year, uh, this is me next to a sheet with a black light. And you can see what comes in here. This is, this is almost all aquatic things. These are mayflies, these are caddisflies, lots of different species. Um, all my childhood years along Red Clay Creek, um, I never saw a mayfly, a stonefly, or a caddisfly come in. And it's hard to imagine now, but in the 1960s, people still thought of rivers as a convenient place to dispose of waste. Uh, in fact, there was a factory just a few miles upstream where I lived right here that made vulcanized fiber. And that process produced a lot of zinc waste that was dumped right into the creek, which destroyed its ability to support most life. And it wasn't just the insects. There were no fish there either. In fact, as a kid growing up along that creek, I was unaware that fish even lived in rivers. Um, Red Clay Creek in the 1960s would have fallen off the low end of that chart I just showed you of the strip tributaries of the, uh, of the, of the Schuylkill. Um, it was so bad. That creek is now still pretty far from pristine, but it's improved vastly since those years, especially since early 70s when the Clean Water Act was enacted. And so that stream does have mayflies and stoneflies and caddisflies in it now uh, quite abundantly. Um, and, a lot, and a number of other rivers have improved due to that too, including the Susquehanna. We've monitored that Susquehanna site since 1974, and we've seen for most of those years, a pretty steady increase in the diversity of aquatic insects there. So I'm gonna end it there and, uh, and, and I guess I can take some questions. Hey, um, Dave, we've had a resounding request that, um, that you go back and cover that damselfly section. So if, if you're all right with it, we're okay I'm fine, with taking yeah. a time to do time that. Time we have, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay, damselflies and dragonflies? Yes, okay. Okay. thank let's, you so much. Let me just um, go in here and um, go back to that. Because there's a really a lot of other groups of, of, of that, are, that are in, uh, wait a minute, here we go. Um, yes, so we'll go to that. Yeah, so dragonflies and damselflies are uh, constitute the insect order Odonata. Now, I didn't really cover them partly because they're most diverse in still waters and, we're, and I'm talking more about streams here. So for instance, in the White Clay Creek, we had, there's 18 species, but only a few of these are, are relatively abundant. Um, like that spe the, the stream I showed you in Costa Rica only had eight species. Um, the nymphs of, now, this is another really ancient group of insects. The, they and the mayflies are the most primitive winged insects. Uh, but they, but that's about where the similarity ends. Um, nymphs of all dragonflies and, and, and damselflies are aquatic and the adults are terrestrial, but unlike the mayflies, they're long lived and all stages of all of them are, may, are carnivorous. So um, dragonfly larvae, this is a dragonfly larva and they're, and they're both, they're, they're ambush predators and, the, and then the mouth up here, they have these little jaws that they sit very cryptically on a stream bottom or a lake bottom, and they snarf up uh, animals that come by. So here's one, uh, one of the longer leg forms. And this guy um, lives a year or two in the stream. When, when 
dragonflies finish their nymphal development, they have to crawl, they all have to crawl out of the stream. And here's one that crawled out of the campsite where I was this summer. Uh, and they crawl sometimes quite a ways from, this was along a lake, they crawl sometimes quite a ways. This individual, here's the, the nymph skin up here, and here's the adult that just emerged out of that. And dragonflies are, unlike mayflies, the process of emergence is quite slow. It probably, it takes an hour or two before they're ready to fly. So when they first crawl out, their wings are kind of crumpled up. They have to pump them up and let the veins harden. And they're very vulnerable for a period of time there before they finish. But this one, after about an hour, this is that individual. This is the adult here. And this is that skin that it crawled out of. Um, and then, as most people know, these guys are amazing flyers and they're predators. And so mayflies have to crew all their bio, all their, all their body mass, all their energy su supplies as a larva. They have, they have no ability to even eat as adults and they live a very short time. But dragonflies um, actually have to feed as adults in order to produce eggs and reproduce. So that particular species there is an unusual one because there's, the, there's an individual just like that one, and this is along that lake, and they lay eggs in these big masses. They almost look like uh, toad or frog eggs. Um, thousands of eggs here of that species. Most, most dragonflies don't do that. They lay eggs individually and you'd never notice them. So now dragonflies are, constitute one part of the order Odonata. Um, the other half of the order is what we call the damselflies. And the nymphs look quite different. So the dragonfly nymphs um, breathe by actually uh, internally have, have water inside the rectum and they suck water in. But the damselflies have these big gill plates out the tail end and they're generally kind of slender things like this. Um, but they're also predators just like the, the dragonflies. So this particular guy here, this is one in a dish. But these guys are really cryptic. This is one on the stream bottom, and you can barely make out where this guy is. There's those gill plates in the back. And they get covered with uh, this uh, silty stuff from the stream bottom, and they sit there very cryptically, and then they snarf up any uh, insects that might be coming by. So the adult stage of this guy, adult stages of damselfly, so the dragonfly holds its wings together like this, when they first emerge, but once the wings harden, they, they spread them out and they never go back. So they always hold them out to the sides and you see all four wings. And damselflies have four wings that are very similar in shape uh, like this, and they're superimposed folded over the back when they're resting. So this is the, uh, what they call the ebony jewel wing, the real common one around here. And damselflies also are known for kind of flying in tandem like this. This is the male up on top here, and this is a female. And what the, these guys actually mate with a female and then they guard that female, fly around like this and make sure that they stay with her while she oviposits. Here's another species along that Susquehanna where I showed you. And each of these guys up top here is a male. He's, he's flying in tandem. The female's down at the bottom there depositing eggs. But damselflies are, are, are strange in that um, if after a male mates, another male, if he mates, he can actually scoop the sperm out and replace it with his own. So that's why they guard their mates like this and make sure she lays the eggs that are fathered by him because the eggs aren't fertilized until they're actually laid. Uh, I think that's all I had on, on that group. How are we doing here? Thanks so much uh, for jumping back and doing that section. I know okay. everyone's very grateful. Um, so I think we do have some time here for uh, Q&A. So people want to use the button that says Q&A at the bottom of their screens. Um, that's a really great place to put any question for Dave. While you do that, while you put those questions down there, and Dave, I'll read those questions to you. Um, once we get there, I just want to remind everyone that you still have time to take the Lancaster Water Week pledge. We have two more pledge packet locations um, where we'll, you can pick up your pledge kit. Uh, each pledge kit contains a free native tree or shrub to help you create hab habitat and uh, collect stormwater on your own property. Uh, as well as a reusable tote bag that's filled with educational materials, and other fun things from our partners. We also have the Conestoga cleanup, which is virtual this year. Um, this is a great opportunity for anyone to get outside and help protect any of the cricks and creeks in our uh, local county that need uh, some cleaning and to get some litter out of those creeks. Um, all you have to do to participate is just click on our cleanup survey at lancasterwaterweek.org. And there you can submit your location and how much trash you picked up. 
and your uh, own location will appear on the map. So we hope that you will participate in this year's now virtual Conestoga cleanup. So with that, let's see what questions we have for Dave. So do you want me to read them? Because I gotta, I gotta change. I, I'm trying oh, to no worries, back. Dave. I will, I'll read them to you. Okay, um, good. It's perfect. Uh, so uh, we had a question from Jeffrey. Are there any uh, ethical issues about uh, caddis fly jewelry? How do scientists feel about this practice? Uh, I don't think too many of us are worried about it. That doesn't constitute enough. So people who do that um, raise the caddis flies, the ones I know that do that, they raise them in, 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 indoors and, and, they, and they provide them with um, materials that they like them to make the case out of. And I don't think they have any adverse effect on the population of the caddis flies out there. In fact, we, we in our laboratory mass rear, we don't do it for jewelry, but you can take one mass of eggs and rear hundreds of, of individuals out there. In, in nature, only one or two of those would survive. So you're not really affecting the population um, by doing that on, a, on the kind of scale that we're talking about for jewelry. And how many uh, cases does a caddis fly make in its lifetime on, on so average? So it generally makes one, but what it does is they, they add on to the front edge as they get bigger. So the, so the diameter gets bigger on the head end. And then as it gets longer, many of them cut off the back end and dispose of that. So it's effectively one case, but it evolves. And so by the end of it, it's a, it's a different set of materials. Some of them though will actually, um, leave their case if you disturb them, uh, they'll bail from it. Um, not many of them do that and I never knew why they do it because it seems like a stupid uh, way of trying to escape predators, but those guys have to make a new case when they do that. <laughs> um, Jennifer would love to know, are mayflies used in medicine? Uh, not that I know of. Mm. Uh, have you heard something? <laughs> no, I, I haven't. Um, I thought it was an interesting question as well, but you never know what nature provides, so. <laughs> Um, Jesse would like to know, uh, could you say something about the different analyses that you do with the internal diverted stream in your facility as compared to in the field? Well, you know, um, when we first did it, there were, there was paired channel, there was two, uh, two channels that were mirror images of each other, uh, in the, in the wet, in the old wet lab. And you could do things like, uh, vary the nutrients or something in one arm and look at the other one. But in fact, you really need for science, you need more replication than that. And so we had other channels that were very similar um, that in green, in, in an old greenhouse we had that were, that we had like six, six or 12 channels. I can't remember how many then were actually, this was back um, actually before I started working here. And one of the early studies we did, which was looking at the effect of a phosphate substitute in, in detergents. And so it was added to those streams to see what kind of effect because phosphates and detergents are, as you all may know, are considered a pollutant and often uh, uh, result in big nasty algal blooms and things. So this was a material that was being considered as a substitute and we were testing it. So we've done things like that. We've also looked at other uh, nutrient additions and what might happen with nuisance algal growth and things. So, and, and, and you can do things in a controlled situation like that uh, that you can't do outside because you can't really replicate your stream outside. And replication is a big part of science. That's incredible. Thank you so much for sharing, Dave. Um, Bonnie has a question. She would like to know how long from the time the mayfly eggs are laid until they hatch? Uh, well, again, that's quite variable. So some, some mayfly eggs enter what we call a diapause after they're laid. And a lot of, 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 of summertime species, species that do most of their growth and development in the summer, have a winter egg diapause. So ones that emerge, adults that emerge in late summer, lay eggs that have to go through a, a 90 days or so of very cold temperatures to what we call break that diapause and before they'll start developing. So those, it might be eight, nine months before they hatch. But those same species in the summer when they're gonna go through another generation, the, the eggs only take 10 days. And uh, 10 days is probably about the minimum uh, for those type of species. But actually, um, I've actually posted a video on YouTube of mayfly, of a, diff of a strange mayfly that 
unlike all those other ones I showed you, the adults live a couple of weeks and they gestate the eggs internally. So when the female lays them, they hatch the moment they hit the water. It's a pretty cool video. I didn't put it in this presentation, but um, I think you can see it. I think you can, it's linked somehow to our website. If you do YouTube and search uh, for um, mayfly eggs hatching, I think it'll come right up. It's actually, uh, for a mayfly video, it's gone practically viral. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. We loved your video earlier. It's, it's very fascinating. Um, how many species of mayfly, caddisfly, and, and stoneflies can be found in PA? Do you have any kind of roundabout idea? Okay, so, um, yeah, when I was, um, so we have like, uh, in, in Pennsylvania, uh, I think the total mayflies is um, 150 probably. Uh, we have 55 right in our creek here, to give you an idea. Um, you know, we have quite, a, there's quite a bit fewer um, stoneflies in our creek here. Um, I think I actually had that figure up on one of my slides. And then caddisflies are, are more diverse. So, there, so we have a, almost 100 species of caddisflies out here. Um, and, and, and over 100 species of, of midges, um, of, of, of dipterans generally. So there's a lot more species out there than you, than you realize. <laughs> Catherine actually, um, who says she grew up exploring uh, white clay, was just wondering if you also might find dobs and fly larvae. And, you do, uh, yep. Okay, you do. There are, there are dobs and fly larvae there, and that's one of the groups I skipped in the name of time here. Uh, and, but they're a fascinating one. Uh, and uh, yes, there are, there are definitely dobs and fly larvae in White Clay Creek. And okay. fishermen love those, because if you, if you put, if you take a, what, what we call the larval stage, the helgramite, and if you put one of those on a hook and throw it in the stream, you will have a fish in short order. So there's areas on the Susquehanna where we work um, that are next to, that are close to popular fishing areas that are almost picked clean. You can hardly find one there because fishermen go out there and pick up every big rock and find one of those things and then turn around and catch a, a smallmouth bass immediately. <laughs> That's fantastic. Thanks for the fishing advice. Um, we have a question from Phil. Do creek walks or kids playing in streams do serious damage to any of these insect populations? I think not generally. So we have that issue right at our laboratory because we have a, an education department. That's a big part of what we do. So what we do is we designate certain areas of the stream for that activity because these kids really need to get in there and get their feet wet to see these things. You can't just do it all in the, in the laboratory or in a slideshow like this, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's really important that they get some hands on. And what we do here, since we have so many students coming through in a year, um, I should know the number, I, I, I just could tell you, but it's a lot on a typical year. And so we designate a couple little areas there that we basically sacrifice for that. But even then, you know, the, 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 complete, the trampling in there, there's still plenty of bugs. So I don't think it has that big an effect. Um, we just, we just partition, we just uh, separate those areas from the areas that we do our, our intense study, long-term studies on. So it just you know, it doesn't have any effect, but I don't think it's a problem. Yeah. yeah, that makes sense. Great Christian uh, question from Kristen. What is your most memorable field experience? <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, I got a lot of those. Uh, <laughs> they probably more often uh, involve uh, interactions with humans that don't quite understand why we're out there doing this kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> like doing things like putting bricks in the stream with leaves attached to them and it, it can be very difficult to explain some of these activities. <laughs> I, I can bet. I can bet. Um, we have a question about what your background is. How did you get to where you are today? Did you have a formal education or degrees that you, you went through to get so, to where so you are? I, uh, I'm one of those people that knew what I wanted to do when I was really young. Um, I, I didn't know you could make a, a, you know, a career out of it, but I love collecting bugs and most people outgrow that at some point in their life. But where I lived in Northern Delaware, um, I was very close to the University of Delaware, which at the time, uh, around 1971, had uh, the largest undergraduate entomology department in the country in terms of number of students. Um, and my grandmother, who lived right up the street from me, was a gardener, and she would go there to get advice on how to do insect uh, control from her garden, and introduced me to the to the uh, 
to some folks in the department there. And the next thing you know, by the time I was in high school, I was working there in the summers. And so I have a degree from the, of from the University of Delaware in uh, entomology and plant pathology, a, a, a joint degree. Um, and entomology is generally taught in the ag schools because most of entomology traditionally has to do with um, insect pests and things. But the entomology there very early on, and the reason why they had so many students at the time, because it was right around Earth Day, and they, and they decided that ecology was a big part of their program. And so it was called the Department of Entomology and Applied Ecology. And that brought a lot of people in that otherwise wouldn't have been there. So, but that's, um, uh, so I have a degree from there. And most people in my field go on for graduate degrees if they want to do uh, research. But um, I took a course by the then director of this laboratory at the, at the university there. And when I got out, I thought I'd take a little uh, interim from school and come work here because they had an opening. And I just never went back. <laughs> there I am. We have time for one last question um, from Jeffrey. Uh, he says he often spy, uh, finds a greenish caddisfly larva in his urban creeks around the Philadelphia area. And he says these are highly impaired creeks. And he's just curious if uh, caddisflies can actually tolerate um, impaired waters. So caddisflies is a group that has, spans the whole spectrum of their tolerance. So some caddisflies are, are pretty tolerant and are, and are still common in highly urbanized situations. And some of those filter feeding ones I showed you are like that. And some species of that have these green bodies and that's probably what you are seeing. So for instance, we've looked at a stream on the, on the, on the uh, Sun Oil site over at Marcus Hook, which was a pretty nasty stream. Uh, and the one thing that was left there were those guys that, you know, of, the, of, the, of what we call the EPTs, the, fem the mayflies, stoneflies, caddisflies. That's what was there. The other two were gone, and most other caddisflies are gone too. So some caddisflies are quite sensitive, but there are some that are pretty tolerant. Well, Dave, I just want to say thank you again for this, this incredible presentation. We're so grateful to you and Stroud for sharing this information with everyone today. And as a reminder to everyone on the webinar, this has been recorded and we will make sure you receive the recording um, with all the great images and information. So thank you again, Dave. Um, and, and thank you to everyone uh, for joining us today. We, we really appreciate it um, and hope everyone has a great rest of Lancaster Water Week. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.